I have a problem. This crosscut sled is way too small, and this crosscut sled is way too heavy. So I'm gonna make a new sled that'll have a big capacity but be super light, and I'll show you my way simpler version of the five cut method that's so easy a third grader can do it. I'm starting with a leftover sheet of three quarter inch Baltic birch plywood, left over from the glory days of when you could actually get Baltic birch. You definitely don't have to use Baltic birch plywood for a crosscut sled, but you wanna make sure to get something high quality so that it remains flat and stable over time. I'm gonna glue these two fence pieces together to make a more thicker and more stable fence. I'm going to also make it straight by clamping it to a level. And if you don't think this level is straight enough for woodworking, then you should probably be a machinist or something because woodworking is not that straight. Now I am admittedly lazy and I don't really care for lifting heavy things if I don't have to. This is what prompted me to make my small and mighty crosscut sled in the first place and I love it. I mean I use it all the time because it's so much easier to grab, throw on my table saw for a quick small cut but it doesn't cover everything. About 5% of the time, I still need to cross cut something wide, like when I made my workbench, those panels were super deep, so I had to use my old cross cut sled, but I absolutely hate that one. I built it six or seven years ago, and the YouTubers told me to make it super massive. I genuinely don't understand why it's better to have one massive sled so that I can try and cut everything rather than having a few smaller sleds that are purpose built for specific tasks. And yeah, a larger sled might take up less space, but like my shop is about as small as it gets and it's just not a big deal to me. In order to make the sled a little lighter, I'm gonna cut off the front left corner where it doesn't really need to be there. The workpiece will be supported more from the fence side and the front of the table saw. So arbitrarily, I just drew a line right about here and I'm just gonna remove this. It'll also maybe make it slightly less tippy on the left side where the edge is slightly hanging over the side. I could also drill a bunch of large holes in the base to lighten it up even more, but that just seems like a lot of work and it's gonna be like enough to prevent me from complaining about it. But I do have to drill a few holes for a very specific reason, and here's why. I do not like making wooden runners for the miter bars. I'll reiterate what I said in the last video. They swell up in the summertime when it's humid here, so then I have to sand them down so that they run correctly, and then by the time winter rolls around, they dry out again, and then the whole thing is just too loose. Boom, aluminum runners. You can adjust them with an Allen key to take up the slop, but in the nine months of using the other sled, I think I adjusted them maybe once, and I think that was because I dropped the sled. I'll leave a link to this one that I used for this sled down in the description. So these adjustment screws have to be facing up and is why I need to drill a few holes in the base so I can access them. I didn't even realize this until after using that sled for a while, but having the adjustment screws on the top makes it super easy in comparison to some others, like this Craig miter bar. On this one, because the adjustment screws are on the side of the miter bar, you have to remove it when you want to adjust it, and then place it back to check if you're good or not. So essentially you're just like guessing and checking. Having the adjustment screws on the top allows you to adjust it and immediately know if you're good or not. All right, let's have a look at this fence because I'm guessing it's dry now. Noise. Flat as a pancake. So I made this oversized in the beginning so I can cut it down now after I glued it up. See, look how pretty that is. The inspiration for this style of sled came from good old Norm from the New Yankee Workshop. He used this panel style sled for pretty much everything, and what really gravitated me towards it was how big of a capacity it has relative to how small and lightweight it is. Also, because the fence is on the far side of the workpiece, it doesn't tend to tip back as much when you cross cut wider boards. Before I assemble this, let's give everything a quick round over to make it less of a hazard because I know myself and I will cut myself on this. Here's a hot little tip for you. I find it's very easy to get a frayed edge when doing a round over on plywood, but to prevent that, I do a climb cut. 
all a climb cut is, is going in the opposite direction where you should be going. Typically, a climb cut will run away on you if you take a big bite. By using a roundover bit that's an eighth inch or less, it's pretty easy to keep control over it. Sawdust can accumulate on your crosscut sled base, and what can happen is that you place your workpiece up against your fence, the sawdust has nowhere to go, and then your workpiece becomes skewed, and then your cut won't be 90 degrees. So what I did on my previous crosscut sled is put a chamfer underneath the fence right here so when you place your workpiece up, the sawdust has somewhere to go, your workpiece can still make contact with the fence. Well, that's a bit of a bummer. I tore a big chunk out. I guess I should have did another climb cut there. Something that I like to do to all my more permanent shop jigs and fixtures is to finish them, but it's completely optional. I just think it keeps it a bit cleaner, keeps dirt from sticking to it. For this, I typically will use a water-based acrylic like General Finishes High Performance because it's quick to apply, dries really fast, and it's just easy to use. Before I assemble this, I just want to hedge a question that I am sure is going to come up in the comments, and that is, wouldn't it be more stable if you put it on the right side of the blade instead of the left side of the blade? And to that I would say, yeah. So now we're going to mount the miter bar. And to do that, I'm going to lower the blade below the table, bring the fence so it's over the blade but just a little bit of the blade protruding on the left side. So side note, these miter bars have these washers on the underside to fit into the T-slot. I definitely don't want those right now because it's gonna prevent me from lifting this out, but I'm not even sure if I'm gonna put these back in the end. Well, I guess we'll see. I have some washers here. I'm gonna lay these in the bottom of the miter slot in the table saw top so that when I put this miter bar in, it's gonna stick up just above the surface of the table saw. Armed with some CA glue, I'm just gonna put a little dab along the miter bar here. With the miter bar flush with the front edge of the table saw, I'm also gonna lay the base flush with the front edge of the table saw too, and I'll put pressure against the fence as I drop it down, making sure that it's aligned front to back. And now I have some of these heavy things to lay on top because I can't really spray any activator down there. Been long enough. Let's see what happens. Now I'm going to more permanently attach the miter bar to the base. And I love using a self-centering drill bit for attaching hardware. Just takes the guesswork right out of it. I got several criticisms in my last sled video for making the base out of three quarter inch plywood and that I am therefore wasting too much of the blade height because of that. But it's been about 10 months or so since I built that sled and I can only maybe think of one time where the height was an issue. So I just used my miter gauge. And this sled in particular is designed for cutting panels, which can be big and wide, but definitely not thick. I feel like people tend to maybe overbuild things to try and make them work 100% of the time rather than more convenient, more accurate, and more suitable for tasks 95% of the time. And I have no idea if that made any sense or not, but all I'm saying is that I would rather sacrifice the height for a more stable base that will remain flatter and therefore more accurate over time. And that last 5% of the time when this sled doesn't work I'm sure I can figure something else out. Let's attach the fence to the base. Now, in my last video, I didn't use the five cut method because I still don't think it's completely necessary, but just to shake things up a bit, I'm gonna show you how I do it. And I'll try and do it in the least boring way I can muster. You will need a pair of calipers like these. You will also need some feeler gauges. Yes, the nerd tools are coming out. Get ready. It's already gonna get boring. I'm gonna screw the fence to the base at the corner closest to the blade. This is the point where we'll make slight adjustments to really dial in the position of the fence. It's kind of like the pivot. All right, so with that one screw in, and I have the other end just clamped on with the fence, I'm gonna put this in the slot. Hmm. I forgot to do something. I meant to cut this first to establish my blade cut line right here. So 
I'm gonna reverse a second, take that off real quick, and do a little zip. Now that this is back here, I can take a semi-trustworthy square, butt it up against the fence, and now I'm going to rotate this so that it is close as visibly possible to 90 degrees with the blade. Without moving the sled too much, I'm just going to drill and sink a screw into the far side so I can take off the clamp. And a screw. The five cut method. What is it and why? Well, a really smart dude named William Ng figured out that you can make a few test cuts and a few measurements and some math to figure out how to make your sled perfectly square. The problem is that I'm a pretty average dude who doesn't like math that much and will do anything to avoid it. So I came up with a major simplification to the five cut method that makes a dummy like me able to grasp it. And the only reason I was able to do that is because the sponsor of this video, Brilliant, made me confident with math. Hey Scott, what you doing? I'm becoming a better thinker. And how exactly are you doing that? By taking this Geometry 2 course on Brilliant.org. Oh cool. But don't you already use geometry and woodworking all the time? Exactly. And Brilliant helps me stay fresh and learn new problem solving skills. You should use it too. I don't need geometry. But you like science, and Brilliant offers courses in all science, math, and computer science subjects. It's got thousands of lessons and exclusive new content added monthly, and you learn very interactively. Sounds fun. And I better not let you become the better thinker in the household. Time to level up and level past you! What a weirdo. Woodworking is but a series of problems to be solved and Brilliant keeps your skills as sharp as a well-stropped chisel. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org forward slash Scott Walsh or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will receive 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. I'm gonna do the five cut method with a 24 inch square piece of half inch plywood. I'm gonna lay this up against my fence. This is going to be the first side I will cut and I'm going to mark it as such. Now I'm gonna go ahead and cut just a sliver off the first edge. I'm gonna rotate this so that the edge that we just cut is up against the fence. That's counterclockwise. And I will mark this as our second edge. Now I'm gonna cut a sliver off the second side. Rotate it again for side three, and I will do it again for side four as well. Now we can rotate this back to side one for the infamous fifth cut. We just need to cut approximately an inch off the first edge. It doesn't have to be super precise. Before I do that, I'm just gonna mark the far side with an F and the close side with a C so I don't mix them up. Now we can use our fun pinchy calipers to measure the far side and compare it to the close side. So I promise you this is really simple. All you have to do is subtract the smaller number from the bigger number, which is 0.072 of an inch. And the only thing you have to do is divide that number by four. That's it. That's how much we need to move our fence by. That's all you have to do. You don't have to do anything else but divide by four. Why? Well, there are two reasons. A, one, our pivot point is as close to the blade as possible. B, or two, our piece that we cut that we used for the five cut method is the exact same length as our fence. Any further explanation, I'll completely lose you. Nobody really cares, but just trust me, it works. If your far side is narrower than your close side, then you need to move the fence in the clockwise direction. But if you're like me and your close side is narrower than your far side, then you need to rotate the fence in the counterclockwise direction. If you need to rotate the fence in the clockwise direction, what you would do is take a block such as this and clamp it directly to the fence like that. Then what you would do is unscrew the fence and then insert a feeler gauge of the correct thickness in between the block and the fence, clamp it back down and screw it into its new position. But if you're like me and have to rotate the fence in the counterclockwise direction, you need to take your feeler gauge, insert it in between the block and the fence as you clamp it down initially. 
And now with the feeler gauge feeling good and snug between there, but not too tight, we can remove it and then unscrew the fence. And now I can pivot the fence into the block, take a clamp and clamp it down tight. Oh, you have to drill a new hole in this. You have to. You cannot reuse the old hole. It will not work. This is not uncomfortable at all. Screw it in. Time to test this out and see if I made it better or a lot worse. Just a little checkeroo, and looks like on the far side I have 0.860. On the close side, about 0.863. Less than a thou across 24 inches, and I am totally fine with that. You can chase that all you want, but honestly it's probably more of an inaccuracy in measuring wood than anything else. I sent a few more screws into the fence to permanently secure it, and then I also had my two foot level clamped to it again, just to keep it straight, just in case. So this super simple panel sled could be done as it is, but I'm gonna add a couple of extra features just to jazz it up a little bit. I like to use stops when I can to get consistent results, and even more so, I like to use flip stops. The only problem is that flip stops are usually pretty janky in my experience, but I have found one that is truly really good, and that is the Veritas one. All the others I've tried are simply not rigid enough. They make two different sizes of these stops. The big one has been excellent on my other sled, but I got the shorter one for this sled because I made the fence pretty short as well. And that's because, like I said before, I'm not gonna be cutting anything thick on this sled. To use this flip stop on the fence, I picked up some of this T-Track. It has a spot on it for an adhesive measuring tape, which I find quite handy. Now it's time to install the adhesive measuring tape. I'm gonna use a six inch steel rule up against the fence. I'm gonna butt it up against the block here. And then I can just slide my flip stop over until it squeezes and tighten it down. Now I can insert the adhesive measuring tape into its little groove and line up the six with this side of the stop. I glued up this small block of plywood to make a stop block extension, which I also made for my previous sled if you saw that video, and it turns out this thing is pretty dang handy. I'm making the extension exactly 20 inches to make the math easy when I want to add it to the measuring tape on the sled. The only weird thing I had to do was notch down this section right here so these little wing nuts wouldn't hit it basically. But just a couple of T-bolts and it slides right in there and you have a long extension for your fence. Remember when you questioned me whether this was gonna be stable enough on the left side of the blade? Well, here's a four foot sheet of MDF. It's stable enough, I can hold it down, and this is the longest thing I would possibly cut on this sled. And, remember when I was worried about this tipping back on me? Well look, it's all the way back here, and it doesn't want to tip back on me at all. Which is great because I can't actually put the washer back on the underside of the miter bar anymore, because it gets screwed down like that through a hole in the miter bar that's blocked by the entire miter sled now. Here's a sled you saw at the beginning of the video that I really want to get rid of. It has a max cut depth of about 20 and three quarters of an inch. The base size to the left of the blade is 21 inches and the weight is 30 pounds which is too heavy for these skinny little arms and in stark contrast is the subject of this video the panel sled 
The depth of the base from the front of the fence to me here is 24 inches, which is three or more inches bigger than that one. To the left of the blade, the base goes 24 inches, which is again, another three inches bigger than that one. And the weight is 10 pounds. That's 20 pounds lighter than this thing. That's something that my weak little arms can lift. So this is a super simple design for a crosscut sled that has the capacity of a ultimate crosscut sled, but it is way lighter and easier to handle. I have a super detailed set of plans that'll take you step by step through making this crosscut sled. You probably don't need it if I'm honest, but if you want to support the channel, the link is down below in the description. And if you can't get enough crosscut sleds, then click right here to watch a video on the small and mighty crosscut sled. It changed my life and it can change yours!